morning and welcome to this live streamed virtual town hall with your state lawmakers from the 40th Legislative District. Senator Liz Lovelett, Representative Deborah Lakanov, and Representative Alex Ramall. My name is Courtney and I'll be your off-screen moderator for the morning. This event will be an opportunity for your state lawmakers to answer your questions about the 2021 legislative session. We sent out a quick survey to residents across the 40th District last week and we've compiled those questions along with some others submitted directly to the lawmakers through email and other means. And this morning, your lawmakers will be answering those questions live. You also have the option to submit any questions you may have during the stream in the comment section on whichever platform you're watching from. With that, let's get it started. I'll turn it over to the lawmakers with some, for some quick opening remarks, and we'll start first with Senator Liz Lovelin. Thank you, Courtney, and thanks to all of our behind the scenes team who worked so hard to make this happen. Wishing that we were out here with you live, but this is a, the next best thing. So welcome everyone, I'm Senator Liz Lovelett. I'm excited to be here today with my incredible teammates from the 40th to talk about where we are place and time at this point in session. Uh, we're a little past the midway mark. So in the Senate, we're hearing House bills. In the House, they're hearing Senate bills. We're working on budgets and, and pulling together requests for, on behalf of our district for capital operating and transportation. Um, it's been a really challenging session in a lot of ways. Um, as you can imagine, the nature of being virtual uh, in the absence of being able to have dinner together and talk to, with each other in the wings and have all those meaningful conversations, it's, it's brought a lot of challenges. But at the same time, we've managed to successfully get a lot of pieces of legislation to the governor's desk already, um, addressing immediate needs for COVID relief, small business relief, and much, much more. Uh, so we're going to have so many great questions coming up uh, to talk about the different policies as they're moving through the chambers. And so I will turn it over to our senior legislator, Representative Lakanoff. Ah, I found the mute. I love. I, I was giggling as the, as we were talking, Senator Lovelett and Representative Rammel, when we were when Liz called me the the senior legislator. I had to giggle and I'm like, Liz, I just celebrated my 50th birthday, um, you know, just three weeks ago. I'm feeling pretty senior these days. So I'm, I'm Representative Lakanoff coming out of the 40th LD. Um, it's a pleasure to work with Senator Lovelett and uh, Representative um, Rammel uh, out of the 40th LD. You know, we're really working hard together. We've really created, I think, a strong team. As always, we talk about how do we better collaborate? How do we engage? We sit down and talk almost on a weekly, if not a couple times a week and our staff are talking a couple times a day. Uh, we really couldn't, and thank you, you're absolutely right, Senda Lovelett, we couldn't do this without the incredible staff that we have with Amanda, Jordan, and Kaylee. So we look forward to an exciting day. We completely appreciate all of you behind the scenes um, and we're gonna take on your questions and hopefully get you guys some answers and thank goodness we're halfway through team. We're halfway through the session. So at that, I'm gonna turn it over to my amazing seatmate, um, Representative Rammel. Thanks, Replicanoff, and thanks, Senator Lovelett. It's it's great to be here with you both today. Um, and thanks, Courtney, for helping uh, pull this together. And it's it's um, I'm I'm right there with you. I wish we were in person, um, able to to meet with folks. I'm looking forward to when we will all be able to do that safely again uh, together. Um, we we'll just echo the comments. Um, I legislating is is a team sport. It's a team activity, and we've got a great team here. And would just emphasize that, you know, it is the three of us, but it's also the folks that work alongside us and our relationships um, with other representatives and other senators on, on both chambers. And I, I feel really fortunate that uh, that we're in a state that has uh, leadership that has been able to carry us through this last year uh, with um, um, a dedication and a focus on protecting public health and following science. Um, and a real commitment to putting people first in, in public health and in uh, recovery for our economy. So it, it is a, uh, a real pleasure and an honor to be part of, uh, part of that team. Um, the only other thing I'd, I'd mention here at the outset, we will do our best to get through as many questions as we can, but uh, I anticipate that, uh, that there will always be more questions. There are a lot of things uh, to lament about uh, the fact that we're not able to meet in person uh, in the legislative session. But one thing that I hope that um, we'll be able to keep doing after this year is really making it more accessible for folks to participate in the system without having to come to Olympia. 
in the future, you'll always be welcome to come visit us, but um, would love to make it easier for folks to not have to spend three hours driving to and from um, or three hours plus a ferry ride uh, driving to and from to just get 15 minutes with us. Want to be able to make those connections uh, over video. You can sign in um, to testify on bills remotely, and I hope folks will be taking advantage of that. Uh, so looking forward to, to digging into questions, and thanks for being with us. Perfect. Thank you all so much. We'll get started here first with some pre-submitted questions. These first few were submitted in advance, uh, but we've condensed them a bit just to fit on the screen. Our first question here is about the COVID-19 pandemic. Somebody asks, we are now a year into this pandemic. What have we learned? Have there been any conversations around de developing an assessment? And seniors are among the hardest hit communities when it comes to COVID. What are our public health officials doing to better protect our most vulnerable communities moving forward? I'm happy to jump in and kick us off real quick. You know, we have dealt with the, uh, a historical time in history. You know, our seniors, our youth, our communities, our businesses, we have all linked arms together and we're trying to find and evolve ways of how we can address uh, and survive through this, through this pandemic. You know, the pandemic has showed everyone can save lives by following the guidance of public health experts. Um, we're basing our recovery on science, and science is what's guiding Washington State. The state is improving the vaccination infrastructure so that when more doses become available, we can quickly get the vaccinations out. I know there's been long lines, many hiccups. Um, we've had bumps in the road on getting vaccination out, and we are consistently trying to, as legislators and as the governor's office, on trying to make things smoother and easier. But I have to say, and I think my colleagues will join me, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, and we're working hard. Right now, we found as of March 8th, healthcare providers have given more than 2 million doses of COVID-19 vaccination since rolling it out in mid-December. We've reached the state's goal of 45,000 doses of vaccination per day, and we're approaching 100,000 doses of vaccination administrated at four state-led mass vaccination sites in the past six weeks. Um, you know, we talked about bumps in the road. Uh, you know, we worked this last two weeks because we found out Anacortes Island Hospital was not receiving vaccinations for four weeks. The three of us engaged with the governor's office, engaged with Island Hospital and the Department of Health. We're proud to say in the past two weeks, 1,600 doses of the Johnson Johnson vaccination went out to Anacortes. This is important for us. You know, in the 40th, we have the Tulip um, Festival opening up. We know Anacortes is the hub of where people love to come and visit and eat. It's the pathway to the islands. The islands was not also receiving vaccinations in a timely manner. The three of us partnered together. It really was the staff uh, finding options, opening doors, getting the right people at the table. Um, we talked about, you know, what did we learn during this time of a pandemic? Uh, Representative Vercelli has collaborated with the governor's office on a state-run bill, 1152. Um, the three of us engaged in that bill. We knew it was a tough bill of um, uh, when it first came out, but through the voices of your own Skagit County, Island County, Whatcom County, we all work together at the governor's office to make that bill better. That bill really is doing an assessment and evaluation to find out where the cracks in many parts of our society have been impacted by this, by this pandemic. House Bill 1152 creates a comprehensive health service districts that will provide equitable service for foundational public health service across the state. Counties over 800,000 may be considered their own um, community, I'm sorry, the uh, community health district districts. It's a, it's a bill that's being able to regionalize the process, being able to identify where the cracks are and provide better healthcare services. It's something that our healthcare providers have been engaging in for the past year. Again, there's more work to be done and Representative Vercelli on House Bill 1152 has committed to working with counties and cities to be able to refine that bill. There's more to come on, on healthcare and what we can be providing and what we can do. And we'll share more information in all three of our newsletters as we learn more and as we move halfway through this legislative session. So with that, I'll turn it back over to our facilitator. Awesome, thank you so much, Representative. This, this next question also came in pre-submitted. Somebody asks, many folks have been struggling with the Employment Security Department as they try to access their unemployment benefits and have been waiting for many months. At the same time, businesses have been struggling with a dramatic increase in insurance rates. 
what has the state legislature done to address these issues? I, I'll jump in on that one, um, in part because it, it impacts my family uh, personally. Um, so, so two questions there, and I think they're, they're different but related issues. And so I'll start with the first one, um, the impacts for small businesses. So the, our unemployment insurance system works by um, um, charging differentiated rates um, to employers who have uh, a high level of uh, employees who uh, use the system. The last year has shown the problem with that in that there are so many employers who had to lay people off because of the pandemic through no fault of their own. And for those folks, uh, they were looking at, in, in some cases, enormous increases um, in those small businesses unemployment insurance. Wasn't fair, wasn't right. It was just baked into the formulas. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to report that we have changed that. Um, that was one of the first things that the legislature did, uh, passed into law and signed by the governor. We put in um, uh, several hundred million dollars uh, to shore up that system to make sure those small businesses didn't get that hit. So that part of the challenge has been addressed. The second problem is really just making sure that um, folks who qualify for unemployment insurance who've had to utilize that system during the last year are able to get the services that they deserve and are able to get um, good, timely communication from uh, the unemployment office. And, and I have to say, I, I, this is something that um, I've, I've watched uh, both hearing from constituents, but also because my son worked at a restaurant and uh, was uh, lost his job uh, because of the pandemic and so relied on that system. And so all of the challenges of being able to get into the system on time, being able to find out the status of your unemployment, being able to get reliable. He went through all of those things and I was right there watching and his his mail comes to my mailbox and so I was watching it happen. And so I know exactly how real those struggles were. And he's among the people who've been getting, um, unfortunately was targeted for um, um, verification. And when uh, that verification didn't happen, they inaccurately determined that he owed all of the money back and has been getting threatening letters that are automated. Um, and so I know the struggles that a lot of people are facing with that system. The challenge is real, it's serious, and um, I don't think we have a solution for it. Our unemployment system had a plan in place to be able to respond to a massive increase in unemployment. Uh, maybe as much as three times um, increase in unemployment. What we experienced last April was more than 10 times increase in unemployment. They were hit with challenges way beyond the expectation of anybody. They ramped up quickly to be able to deal with it, but still a lot of people had to wait a long time and they're still dealing with that backlog. The federal government has changed the rules four separate times in the last year. Um, we've got a lot more work to do to make sure folks get cleared. Um, in the meantime, what I would say for folks who are still having trouble getting in good information, who are still struggling to try and figure out how to talk to a person live like my son was, uh, folks who just can't figure out what it means on the website or the letters they're getting from unemployment, reach out to our offices because we can help get those things uh, moving for you. Great, thank you so much, Representative. Next, we'll be moving to a live question that's coming from our YouTube stream. Joe wants to, Joe is wondering how the Washington State ferry, uh, ferries are doing in the state budget and if something can be done to help Skagit Transit. I'll jump in on that one. Uh, so by way of background in the last uh, couple of months, Representative Paul in the House and Representative Rammel and I have formed a team um, chairing the Ferry Legislator Caucus to be able to have more direct influence uh, on the way that we budget for WSF and make sure that we're capitalizing vessels. So uh, in the, the meantime, so some of the challenges that we're rising to meet are 
One, we've had some really dramatic staffing challenges um, that has made our level of service uh, really have some, some inherent challenges. Um, I understand that um, it, traditionally we have taken on new hires only one time in the year to get staffed up for you know, our peak seasons. Uh, and uh, since then they've decided to do rolling hires throughout the year to make sure that, for, that there's several opportunities to make sure that we have uh, proper staffing levels to be able to maintain our levels of service. Um, additionally, we haven't seen the transportation budgets yet out of the House uh, and Senate. So we're waiting to see how WSF um, fares in, in that budget process. We've only had the opportunity to look at it through the governor's budget. Uh, we're still trying to capitalize a vessel here in this coming budget. Um, and some of the proposals that are, are coming uh, eventually, like Forward Washington and the House transportation package, they're capitalizing up to five. That really helps us make sure that we can get uh, those levels of service, the, the sailing schedules that we need. And for the folks out in the San Juans, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, instead of having a spring sailing schedule this year, they're moving to basically the peak season schedule on May 9th. So they're trying to reduce um, the amount of changeovers and scheduling that they have. Uh, in terms of transit for SCAT uh, transit, the rural transit situation is always incredibly challenging because of low ridership. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that could be done, particularly in the dial-a-ride space, uh, as we try to do some of those last mile connections. When I think about folks out on the San Juans who maybe they wanna be able to take transit all the way down to the city to take in a show, that could probably take you all day uh, to make it down to the city from where you start at your front door out on Lopez Island. So really thinking about how we make those connections from the ferry dock to the transit hubs so that people have better access and continuity, uh, you know, particularly for folks who are disabled or seniors, you know, folks that maybe don't want to drive uh, all of that distance. And furthermore, if we're going to get to our climate goals, making sure that we have options for people to not need to get into their car. Um, so as we move forward, though, the vessels that we capitalize will be hybridized uh, in an effort to not only reduce our fossil fuel consumption, but to um, lower the engine noise to help protect our resident orca. Uh, and so we'll we'll just keep bird dogging that budget and we're gonna put forward, we're working with WSF right now to put forward a capitalization plan to make sure that we are getting uh, the amount of boats that we need to be able to um, not have to pay a huge amount of deferred maintenance dollars on boats that we know we have to have in the fleet. Thank you so much, Senator. Next, we'll turn back to a pre-submitted question. Can you talk a little bit more about the Fair Start for Kids Act and how we can work towards more affordable and accessible childcare across Washington? I can start with that one and then maybe Representative Lakanoff has some other things to add. Uh, so we have already passed out the Fair Start for Kids Act from the Senate. Uh, what we know from the pandemic is that women were leaving the workforce four to five times the amount that men were leaving the workforce because we had to take on that role of taking care of our children. And even for those of us that have to work from home or have the privilege to work from home uh, and, and have our kids here, it's still incredibly challenging to, to meet that need. And in a place like the 40th district where we were already in a childcare crisis, particularly in, in that infant to three-year-old old space, uh, we knew that we had some pretty dramatic steps to make uh, in order to fulfill our, our need for those, those child care positions. And it's, it's not just about having child care access, it's about having safe and quality and affordable child care. There's very few things that mean are more significant to families than the cost of child care or the lack of child care. It prevents women from being able to be in the workplace so dramatically. And especially at a time when we've been talking about our essential and frontline workers to ensure that they have better access to that kind of of child care is so important. And I think about my own situation, which many of us were faced with, where I, I had the opportunity to be able to lean in on my family, but it put us in the position to you know, really have to figure out, weigh the risks of um, knowing that the very virtue of our children going into our parents' homes meant that they were at a higher risk for contracting COVID. So it's, it's a really dire situation. I'm so proud to be able to have co-sponsored and support that legislation. And um, I know that the House had a, another complimentary proposal as well. We did, and thank you, Senator. Um, we did have a, a complimentary bill for the Fair Start for Kids Act, which um, I believe both uh, Representative Rammel and I co-sponsored. You know, the Fair Start for Kids Act really came from Someone as a representative, Sen, who's spent almost 20 years in the state legislature working in early child care and then collaborating with 
the past speaker, Frank Chop. So we knew when these two partnered up that this was a bill that was going to move and it had really strong leadership investments in it. The Fair Start for Kids Act expands accessibility, affordable child care and early child care development programs. Uh, and for us in the 40th, you're absolutely right, uh, Liz, uh, the women and men and the families that are being impacted and the businesses that are being impacted by not having child care access. Uh, really is detrimental for us to overcome this COVID crisis, but also is an opportunity for us to learn what we can be doing better for our early child care. Uh, the child care, um, the Fair Start for Kids Act also established a new account for child care and early learning purposes and includes a non-exhaustive list of allowable uses. We are being very flexible here with, with the opportunities through the act. It increased eligibility, decreases co-payments, in the Working Connections Child Care Program and expands eligibility in the early child, or I'm sorry, early childhood education and assistance programs. It provides for an increased rates training, which is so important, which we heard from the 40th training was very vital, grants and services for child care and early learning providers. It increases supports of families of children from birth to age three, as well as their providers. You know, we had a uh, round table up here in the 40th with our early childhood providers, the small, the large uh, providers, the small providers, and this bill and what's coming through here and the requirements for certification for early childhood wasn't to um, shrink uh, the inventory of early child care providers with grants, funding, and opportunities. It was actually being able to expand for our small uh, providers who are doing providing uh, for our children in homes, but also the large, expansive um, uh, programs from YMCA to the Boys and Girls Club. And Alex, there was some funding that was connected to this. And as as you sit at the, the leadership table and sitting in the finance committee, do you want to talk and expand on that a little bit too? Sure. It, it starts to, uh, I, I think, um, Wait into larger conversation about revenue and uh, progressive revenue and how we need to change our tax code. But the um, the proposal for capital gains tax um, is tied to funding for um, exactly for those services for early childhood education. Um, so that if we were to enact that uh, uh, that bill that's passed out of the Senate, it's in front of the Finance Committee right now. Um, it would be a, a significant portion, $350 million a year of, of that revenue would be dedicated for that account to make sure that we're paying for that priority going forward. Thank you. The next question will kind of bleed into that one you just mentioned there, Representative. This was also a pre-submitted question. Somebody is asking the status of Washington State's finances. What does the financial picture look like for Washington going forward? And what are some particularly high and low spots in Washington's financial situation? Um, I, I can I can start off there and Senator or uh, Representative, if you want to follow up, I um, I guess I would say that um, we just got our financial um, or our quarterly updates on where sort of the economic forecast is looking and how that will play out for our state budget. And things are improved, significantly improved from where we thought they were. Um, it's been a roller coaster this last year, as it has in so many other areas for for so many other businesses and individual budgets. It's it's been a roller coaster for Washington State too. But if you had gone to sleep uh, just over a year ago and then uh, woke up for the first time last week, you'd you'd see that our financial picture is about the same as it was when you went to bed. Um, it, it dropped off a $9 billion cliff and slowly climbed back up over that time. So I'm, I'm grateful that um, we were thoughtful and patient in, and measured in our response. There were some calls all through the summer that the legislature needed to reconvene and begin cutting uh, portions of our safe, social safety net. And I'm really grateful um, that we did not do that because that would have been an, a, a real mistake. Um, we're now um, looking at, um, at at a budget that is about on track with where it would have been when we um, finished the legislative session last year. That's still a, a, a problematic um, situation, though, because we have one of the most unfair, 
unjust, upside down and broken tax codes in the country, if not the worst. Um, folks who make the least in our state are asked to shoulder the greatest share of the burden. Um, folks who make uh, the bottom 20% uh, of income earners in Washington state pay about 17% of their income in state and local taxes. Well, people in the top 20% pay between three and 4% of their income in state and local taxes. That's wrong, it's unfair, and it doesn't work because every time we have a recession, um, cyclical change in the economy, we see this drop in our state revenues and immediately calls to slash the social safety net. Um, exactly at the moment when people need it the most. So I, I believe that we need to be taking big steps uh, to correct that. So while our immediate budget um, outlook is no longer a crisis, um, we should be taking this moment to reassess um, and figure out how to fix our tax code going forward. And, and I would add that, you know, regardless of our outlook at this place in time, that is no proxy for saying that we don't need additional revenue. There's lots of things we haven't been fully funding. Uh, child care is an example. Our schools are not fully funded in terms of counselors and nurses and paraprofessionals. Uh, our, you know, transportation sector has a $3 billion culvert obligation that we need to deal with. And I would personally like to see us paving the path towards universal health care, uh, a, a, a really robust public option through the state. So I think there's lots of reasons to continue to address the tax code and not the least of which is what we heard from Rep Rammel around the upside down nature of who is paying for what and the racial disproportionality uh, of that bottom 20% of wage earners is stark. And we now have the data to corroborate that information to really show that it's time for the wealthiest among us to pay their fair share. And thank you. And both of my colleagues, you'll hear a strong voice in the 40th where we stand completely unified in these values that we're carrying forward on working on a on tax reform. You know, we we also have a lack of funding, not only in our health care education, as our good senator had said, and in social and equity areas. But during these times, we also face a fight to be able to fund our environmental and our climate change um, menus that need to get taken care of. The 40th is a strong district that invests in our environment, it invests in our natural resources, it invests in infrastructure. And we have not only in coming up in two years and Senator Lovelett knows this as being a past city council, um, city council member, but we're also looking to do comprehensive planning and our growth management act, which costs us millions of dollars. But if we don't invest in our growth management, in an adequate way and in a good way that protects the management of growth in our urban areas, but also protects the rural living and values. If we don't have the funding for those type of investments, then we're not only gonna fail as a state, but we're gonna fail as a local government. So the funding that's needed when we uh, take on our tax system is gonna help us address all those shortfalls that are important to the 40th. I hear, a little, bit of, I hear a little bit of Washington Strong coming out there, uh, Senator Lovelett. Uh, uh, thanks for giving me just a few minutes. Thank you all so much. Yeah, next we're gonna move to a Facebook Live question. Somebody is asking what the status of Washington Strong is. Great question. Uh, as you can imagine, Representative Lakanoff and I love to talk about Washington Strong. It's been a, a year of really deep work of stakeholdering, bringing people together, and really trying to figure out how we can solve multiple crises at the same time. We know we have an environmental crisis. We know we have an infrastructure funding shortfall crisis. We're in addition to an economic crisis where we know we want to be able to give robust investments into our community to answer the call to all of those at once. And overlaying all of this is an additional crisis that we have been facing systemic racism in our communities for hundreds of years. And we have got to answer that call in every piece of policy that we develop. And I think very strongly that that really needs to happen in our environmental space. Additionally, this bill was drafted with the concept that until we get 
the lowest income people in our communities able to be enfranchised in the technology and the, the changes that we know are coming, uh, then we're never going to get where we need to go on climate change. So on March 4th, we had our first policy committee hearing on Washington Strong, where 1,015 people signed in pro on a revenue bill, uh, which is pretty extraordinary in and of itself. And the hearing showed that we had not only tremendous grassroots support, uh, but also Strain. We had the Western States Petroleum Association come in neutral. We, um, you know, all of our work that we've been doing in the agriculture, timber, and trucking spaces um, was was evident in some of their written testimony. Uh, so where it is right now is it's a waiting exec out of the Energy, Environment, and Technology Committee. As many of you know, the governor uh, has a proposal called the Climate Commitment Act, which initiates a cap and invest program. So uh, respectfully understanding that uh, that is in ways and means, we are just continuing to perfect, develop the bill, and we have found that there has been that tremendous grassroots advocacy that has been built around uh, the harmonizing elements of this policy are, are requesting both an exec out of policy committee um, and making sure that the bill stays uh, stays at the front of people's minds. Um, it's what we call NTIB, so necessary to implement the budget. Because it is a revenue bill, it's not subject to the normal cutoff uh, that other policy bills are. Uh, so it's uh, we're waiting, we're developing, we're perfecting, we're still taking comments and making sure that the bill continues to reflect the values of not only our district, but the whole state. It was so important to make sure that our rural areas uh, all across Washington could really see themselves in this policy as we work to make our infrastructure and our communities stronger, safer, more resilient. It's been an incredible journey running next to Senator Lovelet on the Washington Strong Bill. Uh, I have her twin sister bill sitting on the other side in the house. Uh, we're holding it there in case we need it. But in the House, we have got a commitment from the Environmental and Energy Chair to hear the bill. So Liz, you to, you get the bill through the Senate. We will help you in any way possible. Those of you who are listening, continue to send your advocacy and your support for the bill. Uh, we will catch it on the House and we'll move it through with uh, as, as fast and as quickly as we can. Uh, so we are working in true partnership. Uh, it's really exciting to know that this bill literally came from the 40th and the 42nd. Uh, the three women who worked on this, myself, uh, Representative Shoemake and Senator Lovelet, you know, we're new to the climate change and the finance decisions for Washington State. For many years, uh, those decisions have been held at tables that were created by those who love the environment, are committed to climate change and really making a difference. And this Washington Strong Bill is just an opportunity that reflects our communities of color, our rural communities, and really opens up the door to have three women sitting down at a table and in a space that impacts the values and the intent of where the 40th is looking to structure climate change, finance decision-making, where the future of the workforce lies within within Washington state. So it's been an honor working with Senator Lovelet. Senator, you, you get it out of the Senate, I'll catch it on the House and we'll graciously move it through uh, the appropriate committees and let's see if we can bring this policy home. Great, thank you all so much. Next, we've got another live question from our Facebook feed. Chrissy asks that you please comment on what is being done to protect salmon runs in the Nooksack and Skagit rivers. I'm happy to start that off real quick. Um, in partnership, we've been engaging with the Nooksack Lummi Nation, Whatcom County, on moving the, the adjudication of water rights in the Nooksack River. Uh, we know that the adjudication process is the only legal process that adequately sets up water rights uh, for that river. The other river that, that we're, the other adjudication process is being done over in the Colville area on the other side of the mountains. Um, the uh, the money that's allocated in the governor's budget is what I'm proposing out of my office that we, we continue to support. Not only does it provide Department of Ecology funding uh, to move through the adjudication process legally and provide the legal background and foundation and decision making, but it also provides uh, technical funding and support for Whatcom County who felt that if they could have the science and the technical support to participate in this, that they were really working in collaboration with the Nooksack and Lummi Nation uh, as governments, but also providing an aspect and a pathway for citizens to engage and be part of, part of that process. So I know um, Senator Lovelet's been walk, watching this carefully on her side and Representative Rammel has also been carefully watching this. So I'll turn it over to them for comments. 
Um, yeah, I, I would just say um, we're we're standing shoulder to shoulder um, in support of fully funding the adjudication process and making sure that uh, that that moves forward um, steadily and um, with purpose and and confidence. Um, Representative Lukanov, if uh, if you're not going to take the opportunity though to brag about your uh, net ecological gain bill, I will brag about it for you. Um, the, uh, Deborah's been working on this bill for a couple of years now. It is, um, I think, a fantastic improvement um, to our state's growth management act, um, changing the requirement for um, for local governments and and public projects that work near um, streams or rivers or wetlands to make sure that as folks are doing that work, not only are we not making things any worse, but we're actually making things better with everything that we touch. It's a great bill. And, it, and the amazing thing is um, that we have support from local governments, uh, which is um, fantastic. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge step in the right direction. And the last thing we've got to do there is uh, make sure we fully count uh, the culverts. Responsibility that Washington State owes. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I got so excited about the Nooksack adjudication, I forgot about my own bill. And thank you. You know, my bill went through, uh, is sitting in the Senate. Liz is looking to exec it out on Wednesday. This bill really brings salmon recovery into the forefront of your Growth Management Act, and it inc is incorporated into your salmon recovery plans. It has full support from cities, counties. Um, it has full support from the tribes, environmental communities. It really is a collaborative effort, and that's what it takes to get bills across the finish line. It um, has the governor's office uh, working towards providing technical support. So we have the funding for this bill, and it also uh, provides funding and support for local governments so they can incorporate this. The wonderful part about it is you now have local governments engaging in salmon recovery with the tribal, state, federal, and international governments. All the governing bodies are working in collaboration for shared science, shared regulatory, and shared approaches on what salmon recovery really looks like for Washington State and for the Northwest. Thanks, Alex, for bumping me a little bit. And thanks, Liz, for carrying it through over in your committee. Great. Thank you all so much. We've got another live question here coming from our YouTube feed. Teresa asks, as a representative of Skagit Habitat for Humanity, I would like to know what your thoughts are and plans for affordable home ownership and housing. Um, I can jump in here on on a couple of a uh, couple of points. One is um, we just have to make sure that we're fully funding the um, housing trust fund. That's money that we put in uh, to the capital budget to support organizations like uh, Habitat for Humanity. Um, like the uh, community land trusts in um, in the different uh, districts and around or the uh, district different counties around the district um, to make sure that folks are able to keep building uh, homes and keeping them uh, affordable for folks in perpetuity. Um, but I, you know, even significantly ramping up uh, that funding isn't enough. We need to we need to be taking more steps. Um, one piece that I've been working on, and I'm, uh, we, we got it out of the Senate, um, been working with Senator Doss, and it, it passed uh, with broad bipartisan support as a multifamily uh, housing tax exemption policy. That's a policy that's in existence right now, but needs to be a lot better um, if we're going to really call it a, a good, affordable uh, housing program. And I think that the changes that uh, have come over that we're looking at in the Finance Committee right now are a huge step in the right direction. And one piece that I'm really um, proud to have been able to, to help um, get into that bill is uh, the creation of a longer term exemption that requires permanent affordable home ownership opportunities. So this will be a way for us to be encouraging developers to build condos. Um, and make some of the units in every building um, affordable for folks below the below the median income. Uh, because one of the things that we were we we really heard about when we were asking stakeholders and um, you know folks who who rely on these kinds of programs uh, for their input is that just affordable rent is is great. It's important for a lot of people. But what folks really want is a chance to build wealth. And so for many of us building wealth, we do it through um, owning our home. 
And we want to make sure that that opportunity is available to more and more people in Washington. And that, that tax exemption policy, I think, is a big part of that. Uh, and I would add a couple of things that are, are very dear to my heart in this space. Um, one is that we, for the first time, were able to get the public financial cooperative bill, uh, AKA the state bank out of the Senate. It will be housed in the housing uh, finance commission office because of their ability to do lending, et cetera. So it's a municipal and county co-op bank that are able to invest in the state to be able to create a lending pool. And we definitely wanna make sure that a piece of that is in the development of affordable housing. Um, additionally, we had a bill that has come through the Senate and I'm not totally sure where it is in the House, Rep. Rammel might know, but again with Senator Doss uh, that I was proud to co-sponsor, has to do with making sure that realtors have equity training uh, as they do their work. It was widely supported by the realtors, but the idea being that we want to make sure that if you're selling houses, you understand the inherent challenges that people of color have in our communities to being able to make that first home purchase. So whether it's just a basic understanding of how redlining has worked uh, throughout history or you know other issues that are, are specific to different uh, demographics within our communities that we're really trying to make sure that we're addressing those at that level as well. And then I'll just I'll just tag up here uh, just to let you folks know also in the uh, first steps the the Washington State passed a bill that gave 325 million in rental assistance for direct rental and utility payments. It focused on households with the greatest funding instability and, and reached through by by and far through organizations. We put $30 million to ramp up um, organizationals operating by and for communities that they serve. This is again for housing. 4 million went into the housing stability services, um, including dispute resolution, legal aid to renters, 4 million into foreclosure, counseling and assistance, 2 million funded for small landlords, most impacted by the unpaid rent, and then 1 million supported for the attorney general for eviction moratorium. So again, putting our COVID funding into housing was really important, but I get really excited. And I know Alex and Liz really liked this bill. If you guys have a chance, look up House Bill 1236, which is the good cause eviction that's being um, worked on by Senator Cooter, but also led by Senator Macri, who again is uh, one of the champions of affordable housing that uh, guides Alex and I. The, just real quick in summary, uh, House Bill 1236 closes a loophole that lets landlords evict people without providing any good reason, which is bad because it allows landlords to use discriminatory or uh, retaliatory reasons to evict, which is against the law. Um, you know, this is really important for us coming in the 40th. We know that the Skagit has the lowest inventory across all counties in housing. We know how that impacts our communities of color. Uh, in the Skagit, we've got 40% of our community is our Latino Hispanic who are paid some of the lowest wages, but are having to look for housing and needs that impact them. We know in Bellingham, we have some of the highest rent also up there in a low housing inventory. And I can't even tell you what's happening in San Juan Islands when it comes to employing their workforce development, but then also some of the landlord situations that we have over there, which I have to applaud uh, Representative Rammel, who's been working uh, with some of the housing issues over in San Juan Islands. Um, and he's really championed that on. So there's some great bills that we're working on in the house to address um, the housing uh, epidemic, but also how do we come to solutions that reflect the real life situations that we're facing in, in the 40th. And I gotta tell you, one of the platform comments that you'll hear in affordable housing and, and the housing inventory is that we can't just face uh, the homeless issue in the housing situation in urban areas. We need, it is a live and it is a it is an issue that uh, Liz and Alex and I say is happening in rural communities. And the 40th is a rural community that we need to be able to address holistically when it comes to finding solutions. So I didn't mean to be so long winded on that, but I knew those were a, a couple good areas that we wanted our constituents to track and follow. So again, that's House Bill 1236. Great, thank you all so much. We're gonna move next to another pre-submitted question. We've got a constituent who's asking about deployment of rural broadband. They ask the deployment of rural broadband and bridging the digital divide is a critical issue. What is the state doing to provide this crucial infrastructure and ensure its affordability for all residents? I'm being so long-winded today, you guys. I'll be quick on this one. Um, 
broadband is a really big issue across uh, across Washington state. We know in rural communities are being deeply impacted. It's been incredible to be able to partner with our representatives. And if you guys take a look at House Bill 1336, House Bill um, 1336, um, it really is providing broadband and public access that's gonna be helped. And we know this in the 40th, addressing hospitals, addressing schools, addressing access to even fill out your unemployment forms. Uh, broadband is much needed and it should be provided as a public utility uh, out there for our communities. Um, it, um, the um, broadband is also a deep commitment for the governor's office who has a broadband office that's being able to accept the grants and funding that are coming to us from the COVID uh, emergency funds that are coming out of DC. I know the Senate's also been working on some broadband and Alex, you've seen some good broadband comments in the committees and it's a priority for the House Democratic uh, leadership table, which you sit at and you have a good voice there. Um, yeah, I, I would just mention a couple of other pieces because I think it, it, it Representative Bukhanov is exactly right. This is so critical for, I mean, we, we sort of knew it was important before and the pandemic has just really uh, reemphasized how important it is um, and how big uh, the difference is between communities that have access to, to um, good high quality internet and those that don't. And um, so a, a couple of important pieces, um, you know, are, are Part of our commitment is to make sure that there are more public agencies that are at the table uh, working on this. Um, and so that uh, that Broadband Act uh, really just does make it so that, um, you know, if the PUD in the area wants to work on it, the PUD can and should work on it. If the Port District is the right uh, entity to do that, then they should be able to do it. We want our public agencies um, at the table helping to work on this problem. And then um, in, in, in the transportation space, um, we just dig up roads. Um, routinely as a matter of course and as part of maintenance. And um, we have a dig once policy for other infrastructure. Uh, we Apparently it doesn't uh, always cover broadband. And so that's a big piece of uh, what, we're, what we're trying to fix right now is um, so that we can make sure that we're um, extending broadband um, and that sort of internet backbone wherever and whenever we're already doing work in uh, in state roadways as well. Um, so those are those are some of the big pieces that we can uh, take on right now. Great, thank you all so much. Next, we've got another uh, pre-submitted question. We've got a constituent asking about learning. It is no surprise to anyone that online learning has been a challenge for many of our students, parents, and teachers. What are some of the action, actions the legislature is taking to ensure we address the challenges in K through 12 schools, including learning loss, learning recovery, youth mental health, and the digital divide? What does the hybrid learning model actually look like and how can we ensure it remains safe and successful? That's a great question. And as a parent of two school age children, uh, you know, it's it's been impressed upon me very strongly uh, in my own house, how important some of these and how challenging some of these situations are for, for kids across the state. Um, so first off, trying to get the broadband piece together. And so our um, Senate K-12 chair also is a retired um, Apple executive. So she's been working very hard on trying to figure out how to particularly get to the unserved areas for those kids that are you know, driving 10 miles and sitting with a hot spot near a public facility where they can actually get some internet access. One of the things I have been heartened with in the way that our school districts have been embracing our kids as they come back to in-person learning is that they very intrinsically understand that our kids' mental health needs uh, are going to have to take kind of an immediacy over, um, you know, kind of the, the normal academic rigor that they would be having for kids and understanding that it was um, deeply inequitable for many kids in our communities. Some kids thrived with online learning. They loved that format. They just clip through their work. They get it done. They're doing fine. Um, other kids have really struggled with that. And especially with working parents and that lack of childcare that we talked about earlier, parents weren't necessarily able to be around to even help their kids um, make it through those online learning modalities. Plus just that, that um, you know, the CDC has, has a lot of information about the amount of screen time that our kids have and what that does to our mental health. So I think that as they um, transition back into in-person learning in the coming months, um, that that social emotional piece will start to work itself out um, in that there's 
are seeing their peers again and having some normalcy in their lives. And then we can start addressing some of those learning gaps. And the teachers are being very gracious because they know that not every kid has been able to keep up uh, during this period of time. Um, additionally, we've done we've had to do a lot of things with their funding uh, because they're they're based on how many kids they have in school, how many kids are riding the buses, and so we've been working on making sure we have restorative financing both at the state level and the way that we apply uh, CARES Act and other federal stimulus money to make sure that our school districts aren't economically penalized because they've had a lower enrollment. Um, and of course, has been very fortunate because we already had a technology levy, and we've done a lot of public private partnerships to make sure around the state that kids have access to devices uh, because not every household even has a computer in order to do online learning, let alone four of them because there's four kids in the house. So I've been really proud of our, our corporate partners that have stepped in to help try to provide uh, devices for kids in their time of need. Um, it's been a real challenge, but our teachers have done an incredible job of just on the fly developing curriculum, finding meaningful learning opportunities, and trying to engage our kids and trying to find meaningful social interactions for them. So hats off to our teachers. I'm so glad to hear that we have vaccinations rolling out for them so that they continue to they can continue to return to in-person learning. Great, and one last question here before we get to some closing remarks. This one was also pre-submitted by a constituent. What is the status on police accountability reforms? Do any of these, uh, the existing bills address the evolving needs of our communities, such as increased need for support services for folks with behavioral health issues? You know, I'll start off real, real quick here. You know, I had the pleasure of working on police reform, a police reform committee uh, with our communities, with our members of color in both the House and the Senate. You know, the top line messaging that we always share when it comes to public safety is our goal was preserving, protecting people and communities. Um, and we must keep our law enforcement and make sure that they are valued and make sure they have the training and make sure they have the adaptability of what police and public safety looks like in the world of today. Law enforcement must build trust with our communities. We know there's been a breakdown in trust, but we have to rebuild that together. And we have to build it with accountability and transparency. We went from 60 bills in the House and the Senate, and we have five priority bills that are being covered within Washington State. Uh, we have Senate Bill 5051, Senate Bill 5066, Senate Bill 5118, Senate Bill 5036, and Senate Bill 5164. Uh, we also have um, an opportunity in these bills that are really looking at you know, preserving and protecting our police and communities. Um, we also need to know when we're dealing with these, with our police accountability, we wanna make sure that we're setting really high expectations. And setting expectations is part of House Bill 1310. It requires that de-escalation is an officer's first instinct and officers use reasonable care when using force. You'll see me looking through documents and making sure that when we report out on, on our police accountability and our public safety, that we wanna make sure that the terminology and the words that we're using is fitting to what the bill and the intent is. You know, we're looking at House Bill 1054 when we talk about, again, setting expectation. It sets a baseline of acceptable tactics and equipment to uphold those values. Take a look at House Bill 5066. It requires officers to intervene when they see one of their own violating someone's rights or using unnecessary force. We've heard in testimony from sitting with officers and sitting with our public safety that oftentimes things are happening and they don't have the protection to be able to report out what's happening. So it's part of the whistleblowing uh, Protection Act. Senate Bill 5066 requires officers to report unnecessary use of force uh, to their superior. This is really important. And it's part of a police, police tactics reform that we need to cover. We talked about the increase of behavior health and the criminal justice reform. We've been including funding within our behavior health um, to be able to create more um, of our uh, career employees and behavior health to where they can ride and work within our system. We know police officers aren't the behavior health specialists. They aren't the ones who are working on suicide. They are not the ones on the street uh, addressing um, uh, overdoses, but they are the ones that are, that are being called out there. Um, we need to be able to build that workforce development of behavioral health so we can be able to relieve that. You know, we passed an, an important bill on the House floor by Representative Orwell. It's the new suicide number. And, um, you know, Alex can talk a little bit about this too. And I'll let him announce that number because um, I want him to share in part of this success. Uh, 
this is an important aspect because 911 was being used across the board for everything. But this new number is specifically for providing help to suicide uh, to suicide victims and providing every step that's needed forward. You know, I want to compliment too. I learned from the um, up in Whatcom with the firefighters, they were bringing with them and their EMT workers, behavior health and social service uh, workers to help them address those emergencies. The Mount Vernon Police Department has a social worker on, uh, on staff that goes out and travels with the Mount Vernon Police when they deal with these um, uh, social and behavioral health situations. So we're quietly making positive steps forward, but the bills that we're passing in the Senate and the House is really gonna bring it up to a level where we can trust our police force once again, and they no longer become the police force, that should become the police, the peace officers that they were intended to be. So Alex, I know you were excited about Representative Orwell's bill as much as I was. So I'll let you announce the, the new number and maybe talk a little bit about that success. Sure, so thanks. Thanks for that opportunity. The, um, the the new number will be 988. Um, I believe it goes in uh, goes live later this year. And so this is really just um, an, an opportunity to sort of say, what are things that we're right now asking police to do that could be better done uh, by folks with a different skill set and with different training? And responding to people who are in mental health crisis and contemplating taking their own lives. Um, that's that's a really important thing to get the right people to those scenes to to respond to, um, and so the 988 system is uh, is an opportunity is is the way that we can do that. Um, and so excited to see that moving forward. Uh, we passed it out of the house just last week. Uh, Senator Lovelet, it's on its way over to you, and uh, hope to hope to see that go into effect uh, later this this year. And I just, I just really, really want to reiterate what uh, what Deborah said about um, our our charge this year. There's a lot of bills. There's a lot of things to keep track of. There are a lot of moving pieces. But core to it all is that we need to be. It is so clear looking at the news, looking at um, information that's come out, especially over the last year, but if you're paying attention for a long time before that, it's so important for us to build trust between communities and law enforcement. Um, and so, you know, we had a lot of bills moving. It is a lot of moving pieces. And I think there are folks in law enforcement and local government, especially, who are wondering what's going to happen, how are all these things going to come into play. Um, and I would just really reiterate the, the importance of building that trust into action now. But I'd also really emphasize to folks who might be concerned that things are moving too there that I really believe that an, an exemplary public process happened um, in our public safety community. Um, the uh, police tactics bill that uh, Deborah mentioned, uh, 1054, um, was one that I heard concerns about from our uh, police officers, from uh, police chiefs, from local government officials. And by the time we voted on it, Fraternal Order of Police published in the Seattle Times saying they were in support of the bill because they recognized the value of rebuilding that trust. And so I think I think there is a lot of work to be done by uh, shoulder to shoulder. So um, emphasizing. Great. Thank you all so much. It looks like that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you to everyone who watched and for submitting your questions live. If we didn't get to your question during the live event, you can always reach out to your lawmakers. We'll make sure that their contact information scrolls across the bottom of the screen here in a moment, and it will show up in the closing video as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the lawmakers for some brief closing remarks. Senator Lovelet, did you want to start us off? Sure. Well, thank you guys for taking time out of your day on a Saturday to come find out what's going on in your district and your state. Um, I've o I'm always so impressed with the 40th district's uh, ability to show up, to consistently show up on behalf of grassroots organizations, um, advocacy groups, um, showing, calling our offices, letting us know how you feel. I mean, it really does help us to know. Um, and I would also be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Jordan and Kaylee and Amanda in our offices who are just incredible. And we have a team, not only as legislators, but an incredible team behind the scenes um, who really make our offices accessible to everybody. So thanks for being here today. 
Great, and I'll jump in real quick. You know, we've had an incredible uh, time working with my colleagues. I really want to say, you know, there's a couple bills in labor that we want to be able to focus on. Um, if you guys want to take a look and send advocacy in, uh, House Bill 1076 is the Worker Protection Act that protects whistleblowers. Our expanded access to paid family and medical leave is a great bill, House Bill 1073. But to my agricultural community, Liz and Alex and I, really have been focused on protecting our agriculture community to make sure that they get the vaccines out. They're out in the fields already working hard to put food on our table and put the flowers of daffodils and tulips into our stores to remember that we need to protect our agricultural farm workers. You're gonna see Senate Bill 5172. Um, it is an important bill. It really does reform to the injustices of farm workers. So if you all wanna take a look at that and send in your advocacy comments on it, I think it's going to be important, but the three of us work hard to protect our labor community um, and our workplaces and our agricultural community and our migrant farm workers. And it's part of who the 40th is. So thanks for being here today. And let me plug in a few more bills you all can look at. Like Alex and Alex, Alex and Liz are going to, our, our LAs are going to be like, Deborah, we're going to get more, more emails and we're going to say yes, yes, yes. So Alex, I'll turn it over to you to close this I, out. I, I love it. Um, Debra is always hustling for bills um, and always working, even uh, even in the town halls, is, is plugging those priorities. Um, great, great work. Um, you know, I, I would just say my, my two biggest uh, things that I always want to emphasize uh, when when um, in, in these kinds of communications is just that uh, the, the three of us are really standing shoulder to shoulder, that we're working together um, on behalf of the communities that we represent, that uh, we want to be um, strategic um, and thoughtful so that we're um, speaking with one voice on our budget priorities and policy priorities that we're working things out um, so that um, we, we can do the best job that we can for this community. Um, and I, I, I hope we um, evidenced that commitment uh, today. And then the, just the second thing, I, I really just want to emphasize to everyone listening, I'm so grateful for all of you that are tuned in and paying attention uh, for those of you that have reached out with um, emails and um, asked for um, meetings, constituent uh, connections, and all of the ways that folks are plugging in. Our state government works better with more people participating. Every one of us is uh, better able to do our job um, as an advocate for, for these communities with your voices in one ear, helping us figure out how to do better. So, so please keep uh, keep reaching out, uh, stay in touch, um, use the opportunities, especially uh, the new ones, to, to weigh in on bills, to testify remotely. Your voices matter and help us do our jobs better. And uh, we're, we're great for, for every time you, you reach out, let us know. So thank you so much. And uh, to, to, to all of you. thanks so much.